Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the House of Commentary, and we are now looking at episode 7 of She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. Today's episode is called Just Jen, and my really is Just Jen, and it's just, just Jen, nothing I else, know. nothing I else know. happens at all. <laughs> There's no one else, there's no, nothing else happening in this show, it's just Jen. <laughs> As, as as we will find, and uh, hello, listener, as, as we will find, um, it's a remarkable episode, but why it's remarkable will now be discussed. I think it's great that you said hello, listener, because we may only have one listener, <laughs> but actually we've got quite a few views now. Yes. yes people, people are, are, people people are, are listening. So yeah, to those of listening. you who are listening, thank you. Yeah. And uh, we even had a couple of comments, so... Um, that's very, Keep and them also, coming. And Keep also, them coming. And also for those who uh, want to listen in the car, we also have the podcast as well. So let's start with, as as usual, the format is that we'll uh, go through the script first to, to help those people who uh, have have either seen the episode and not uh, and not really can't recollect every single moment what they did want to. Um, this is a spoiler heavy episode as usual, so please be aware of that as well. I'm glad you said that because we've not been spo- we've not been pre- prefacing any of our episodes yeah. with that. Yeah, we are well, <laughs> as, as best we can, as best yeah. we can. <laughs> Just, you're going to get the whole sense of the episode to the point that you may not need to watch the episode, guys. <laughs> Just to yeah. let you know. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The the uh, script review, I think, works quite well because we get to remember what happened in the episode. We get to really narrow down on the fact that, you know, especially with this, this sort of series, we've been focusing heavily on the writing. And the, the review of the script is actually really helping us with this. So you know, let us know how you feel about it, but we're, we're enjoying it so far. So let's just get, dive straight in. So just Jen. Starts with you know the standard pre pre title screen recap. They've done a little bit of a focus recap for this one, where they are talking about Emil Blonsky. So we know he's going to feature heavily in this episode. And uh, what did you think? I was really hoping Daredevil would be in this episode. <laughs> where do I start? I think the first. I think the first thing is to say. The expectation for this was high. It was very high. Mm. And when there was no mention or indication of Daredevil, you're wondering, what the hell is going on? Have I just switched on to the wrong episode or something? I, I'll be honest, I was really hoping, even when we were watching the recap, and even when I knew all hope was lost, there was a small part of me that was hoping that the reason they're showing Emil Blonsky is because he is the abomination, and therefore we'll need She-Hulk and Daredevil to sort it out. You're thinking like a true, a true supporter and fan of superhero comics, superhero comics <laughs> which these writers are not. Which they're not. They really don't understand. Um, fine. We what they actually did was a bit of a narrative thing. So, so they've introduced Emil Blonsky, and they're trying to make a point to us that he has a resort. He has a meditation resort that he's opened. And that's really what we get from the, the pre-title role, the recap. The title screen plays as normal. And then we get what I think is the second strongest, I don't know what to call it, second strongest scene in the entire series. Which one was that? The role of her texting back and forth with John. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. So, it's quite strange because this particular introduction, I think, is almost like a music video playing out. That um, this female group of scriptwriters have probably been dreaming of for the last twenty years in terms mm-hmm. of wanting to do, mm-hmm. in which uh, there's a. Uh, there's texting going on between Jen and Josh. this guy called Josh. You might remember from the previous episode, he was actually her date on the, in the eventually her date on the uh, wedding. Um, and it's not bad because it's a video. If you treat it as a video, music video, 
it's shot like a music video. Um, anybody who's used to seeing MTV will look at it and think, yeah, not bad, not bad, you know. Multiple, uh, you know, there are various scenes where you see Jen in um, basically three or four times at the same time, which is great. And again, all standard type of uh, video stuff. Oh, thankfully, she's not dancing or anything, but it's it's not bad. It's got a nice sort of vibe to it. You think, okay, fair enough. They're not going to give us Daredevil. They're going to give us this instead. Yeah. Um, the strongest piece of directing, I think, in the or, or cinematography in the series so far, I think. I think that that is true. Um, it tells a but story. It's, but it's also interesting that there yeah. were virtually no words spoken. I was about to bring that up. <laughs> So the strongest <laughs> part of the whole series has no words in it. No words in it. And that really reflects the fact that the script is terrible. Yeah, Every time it does. the script is involved, it ruins the show. Yeah. These are, these are, unfortunately, this is a this is a series where the words get in the way. Yeah. So just um, to recap that scene again in a, in a short way, I guess the thing to say is it's a continuation of Josh and Jen's relationship from the wedding that we've seen before. Jen and Josh have gone on a couple of dates. And basically, after a couple of text, a little bit of texting, three days worth, they go on a couple of dates, and then eventually he sleeps with her. And at the end of this thing, she wakes up and he's not there. Yeah. And she sends him a text saying, that was fun, I can't stop smiling. And then she puts the, te- the phone down, and then she's now stuck because he's not texting her back. Yeah. And it turns into this thing of her constantly checking her phone. I'll be honest, I think there was a bit too much time spent on them just showing us that she's just checking her phone over and over. They probably could have done that a little bit less. But fair enough, they did what they wanted to do and they have to fill the 19-minute time slot that they're using. So, <laughs> it's, it, it's, Again, this is a v- again yet another short episode. Mm. We need to stress that. This, I don't know why it is, but Disney have these... The episode that's always shown as 37 minutes or 38 minutes or whatever it is, it was in the upper 30s, but the reality is you're only getting about 20 minutes or thereabouts. And you know this is going to be a bit of a strange episode where the mm. first almost four or five minutes are spent on a music video and then her sort of trying to, um, yeah, basically looking at her phone. Yeah. And and you know there are some elements to it that are good. I, th- I think I think this is as you said before, this is probably the best thing they've done in the terms of uh, Jen's character because um, even when she's She Hulk and all that kind of stuff, no words are spoken and it's all fine. Obviously, words have to be spoken, and then we come to <laughs> then, the, then the the whole episode falls apart. Well, it's just, just <laughs> it's just to get it, it. It really instantly falls apart. So oh, you maybe, uh, we'll no, trust me. When I when I tell you about the script, okay. We're, we're, so, so we've just given this show some praise. I yes, we, we have. have. Yeah. Let's yep, just take yep. a second to just just acknowledge that we're not here just to bash a show. Yeah. So for me, we are looking for every crumb of comfort we can possibly find. For me, the first, the best scene still in the whole series is Jen with her dad in episode two. I think it was. Where he gives her a bit of obviously in the garage. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think that's probably her, her best. And scene. and now this is the best piece of cinematography that I've seen. So now we move into the show. <laughs> so yeah. So we now we have Jen in her office with Nikki, who is her best friend, and Nikki says, "Jen, you didn't tell me you were nominated for Female Lawyer of the Year." Oh God, yeah. <laughs> And then, then I remembered what show we're watching. Yes. And I remembered what the script writing's like. This is a classic example of where um, the beginning of the show is done reasonably well. It, you you feel that something is being set up and then you're brought back to Earth. Basically, we're talking about somebody who we can see for the last seven episodes or six episodes has never won a case really is just almost on an ego trip when it comes to sort of um, saying they're a good lawyer um, and has displayed zero, zero um, elegance and eloquence and thinking in terms of being a great lawyer, in my opinion. I'm sure others will disagree, but that's my opinion. And all of a sudden, she's 
being nominated for a big award for being yeah. a great a lawyer. A huge award. This is a classic example of where people just basically, the, the writers, um, I don't know, they're living on a completely separate planet. You know, it's just, it's pathetic. It yeah. really is. We you have know? to really think about this. And, and I know this is just the first line of the whole it's show. It's a fairy tale. That's but, gone really bad. It's but we really need to just focus in on this line because it again shows that the writers do not know what they're doing. They're just picking stuff out of a hat and all they're trying to do is probably justify what's happening in the next episode, right? They want... We've already seen the trailer that oh, Jen goes in this amazing dress to this big event and that's what it's going to be. It's going to be her going to see if she gets yeah. the award. Yeah. And what they need to do is justify the, the next episode by sort of putting in a one-off line where we say, oh, well, she was nominated, therefore she won. But really, what have we learned about this character which suggests that she would ever be nominated for this award? At the beginning of the show, in the first episode, right at the beginning, she's practising her speech to, a, to her friend and a guy who doesn't respect her. Yeah. That case ends because she punches someone in the middle of a courtroom. Correct. She then loses, she loses her, her job. job. Because they say, well, juries can't, juries will unfavorably rule in your, your favor now because they know you and they like you. Then she gets another job. She still hasn't won a court case in a room with that, with that new firm because she, she, well, she coerced someone yeah, and, and yeah. forced them against their will to sign a, a, whatever it was, piece of paper in episode four when Donny Blaze. She basically said, here's a demon that I'm going to make kill you unless you lose this court case. She, unless you cease and desist from yeah. using magic. She allowed, you know, and yes, Emil Bronski got paroled, but that's not a court case. Yeah. And then she got sued for using her name and Mallory had to win for her. Yeah. Why is that's Mallory right. not being nominated for Female Law of the Year? If anything, she was shown as a very strong lawyer in that case, in that episode. Well, one of the things that um, I'm not sure if you noticed, but um, and this really shows the laziness of the writers. Um, Jen Waters is now, work because she lost her job, um, she's now working for a, a law firm which has a division specialising in helping those people who have got powers. Um, and one of the conditions is that she work as She-Hulk. So She-Hulk is actually representing her, uh, these clients, not Jen Waters. And the picture shown for this award is Jen, Jen Waters, Waters. Who, really does not, who does not do any blooming legal work now, yeah. effectively, because it's She-Hulk who's I doing didn't even, it. I didn't realise that. That's it's a really good so point. It's so stupid. They've, they've, they've actually lost... They've actually lost... Um, sight of the previous episodes. Yeah, that's so true. I that didn't even is, think about that. That is just so if, stupid. If anything, it, she could have been unfavorably. She she could have been. Um, what's the word? She she could have been nominated as Female Law of the Year as She Hulk purely based on popularity in the media. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that they put Jen Walters' picture. Suggest that they completely flopped it. They completely flopped it. And it, I, I, when I saw that, I thought, oh, my God, this is like someone making a film, like, like one of those old Treasure Island films where you've got Long John Silver, and in, one, and in one scene, his right leg's cut off, and in the other scene, they've forgotten that it's actually his right leg, and they've treated him as having his left leg cut off. But it's that basic an error. Yeah. And again, the other thing I want to just make a point about this, I know we're banging on about this, but it's, it's such a big deal because really it just shows how bad the writing is. Why did it need to be female lawyer of the year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also stupid. So Surely what, there's a male one as well? Is, is, this, <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this the same as, you know, like, you're not in the Olympics where men are running against men and women are running against yeah, women. Yeah. You fight men in the courtroom. Yeah, exactly. So if you're exactly. exemplary at your job, if you're good at being a lawyer, Surely you'd just get nominated for Lawyer of the Year? Exactly. And and to be honest, I think that is usually what it is. I mean I'm not I, I am aware of awards being given to lawyers and other, you know, other professions. Um, but it's very rare to see a, where you're in a proper profession like the legal system yeah. or or medicine or whatever, 
that is women only and men only. And the weird thing about the whole of this is that you know, we talk about how woke these people are. Um, one of the points that they keep on pushing is this idea of you shouldn't have a best actor or best actress. You should just have best actor, i.e. men and women. Yeah, because they're both acting. Yeah, and it's just it's, it's just weird. Not only have they forgotten this the, the episodes they've written, they've... It's almost in this moment they've also forgotten what it is that they're trying to push down everybody's women's throats. Yeah, and they're trying to show... This is the thing. They're trying to show that women are equal to men, right? They're trying to show that women are actually better than men in this show. Yeah, they are. Now, surely... And that continues. That surely, continues the way, well, surely the way to, to do that is to make her lawyer of the year Yeah, yeah. and show exactly. that she can beat men rather yeah. than say she has to compete in her own category. I know, I know. It's it's bizarre. If anything, the, these... you're you're getting rid of some of the points that you're making in the early episodes by creating a award that's purely for women. The whole point is is that she is better than a lot of these men, so surely she should be winning an award ahead of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that so... was the first line of the show, guys. <laughs> I know it's terrible. The very first line, or effectively the first line. Yeah. So then Nikki says, uh, she said, you don't tell me you were nominated for the female law of the year, but they didn't tell us either. And then she said, <laughs> does this mean we get to go to a gala? So she's yeah, obviously all setting, set up, up, the, setting up the next yeah. episode, or well, maybe the final episode, who knows. And then she said, uh, she sees Jen looking at the computer and she says, oh, are you, uh, are you going down a rabbit hole on that intelligentsia site? So they're just reminding us that there's uh, sort of forum based site with evil people who are saying negative things about Jen well, they're ex- and yeah, they're, they're know, extremely hateful of um, She Hulk death threats and these sorts of things. Yeah. So Jen says, What? No, I don't care what a bunch of losers say about me online. Can't even say it to my face because they're going to get Hulk smashed. Okay. And she says, No, I'm waiting for a text from Josh. I mean, and, all of uh, this language that suddenly started is being, starting to be used, sort of. What, enable her to sort of say, I've manned up? I've, I don't know. It just, it's just pathetic. You would think they would come up with some, here's somebody. I mean, the reality, the, the impression they're trying to give is that she's in love. And that's how she's talking about this other site. It seems stupid. Yeah. Well, yeah that and, she's a bit and, anxious, the lack, and, the, and the lack of intelligence yeah. in terms of trying to deal with something like that. Come out with a couple of smart line, one-liners and you're sorted. But no, they just don't do it. Yeah. And they also, just don't I think... do it. I think it's just fair to say we got the point that you're waiting for a text, you know? I Sometimes I feel like this show just really thinks that people who view it are, you know, devoid of brain cells. Yeah, we need to be constantly I, reminded of what happened the just two minutes earlier. The fact that they just earlier. showed us, they just showed us a montage of her waiting for a text. Yeah. She's doing yoga, she's waiting for a text. She's looking That's at her right. phone, she throws the phone to the side, she's getting frustrated, and then... The third line of the show, fourth line of the show, is still, I'm waiting for a text from Josh. Yeah. I know she's technically saying that to Nikki, but really those writers are saying it to us. Yeah. And we know that. Just go back, just step one back. I mean, this is really starting to get getting to me now. There's a scene where she's watching Miss Piggy on the TV. And Miss Piggy's hulking out. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, trying to hulk Bending out. Bars in in a, and she's in a prison. And how... I, I, I saw that and I thought, what the hell? You're trying to make fun of yourself. You know, if you actually think about what the what she sh- what she should be going through, uh, in terms of she thinks she's found the man of her dreams and she thinks that and all of a sudden there's no response. That's what you're gonna see on TV? You would yeah. you'd you'd think they'd be it, they'd be this... showing something a little bit more in tune um with yeah. That, guess, that sort of path, but it's it's all that these writers are trying. I, mean, I don't know. They're not. They're not being funny. They probably thought it was not funny. funny. What's it's not the funny Piggy at all. Thing? Is Miss Piggy? Uh, she's with Kermit the Frog. Isn't yeah, she? yeah. Is she this character who never gets? She she constantly craves his attention but doesn't get it. Or because then I guess if that if that is the case, then no. maybe there is some reflection in the episode. Oh, I mean, she wants to marry him basically, but the it's just a. St- I mean, what the hell are the did use the Muppets like that, uh, does this demonstrate that this show is actually aimed at five-year-olds? 
I mean, to yeah. me, it, it, it just seemed it, it thing, wasn't funny at all. It was totally, you know. But inane. if we think about it, if we think about it, let's say I'm right about this Miss Piggy thing, right? Yeah. So let's say Miss Piggy is a character who constantly craves the attention of Kermit, but she doesn't get what she wants back, right? Yeah. So that and that's reflecting how Jen is feeling in this episode, which is that she's trying to reach out to this guy that she had a really good time with, and she's not getting any response. And that's how she's feeling. It, it's not that deep. There's so much that you can yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, the yeah. fact the fact it's... that you spent a scene reflecting how she's feeling in this episode, no one's going to care. Just write better stuff first. Yes, yes. You know, you spent half an hour thinking about that thing. You spent three minutes writing the episode. So Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. Okay. So, so... <laughs> it, it doesn't balance it out, guys. So where did we get to? So yeah, so she says she's waiting for a text from Josh, and Nikki says, "What? Okay, that's enough for you. You need to set a limit so you stop checking that, which is true." And then Jen says, "Oh, what about just hourly?" And she says, "No." And uh, Nikki says, "It's just the first twelve hours after you sleep with someone for the first time. It just feels icky. You got to coast through it without doing anything stupid." And then Jen says, "Why can't he just text me back? Why is that so hard?" There's no reason nowadays not to respond to a text unless you're the bad guy in the series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Unless you're unless you're like every other man that's portrayed in the series where of course they're not going to yeah, do what yeah, you want. Yeah, exactly. Them to do. And and to be honest, this whole um in the previous episode when they introduced his character I had I actually uh I thought it was a bad guy coming. And the whole way this ep- the, the, the setup of the episode, um, of this episode, was, you know, it's obviously, um, I think, I, well, as we'll see, I, I think it's, it's, it's so obvious what's going to be happening. It isn't going, uh, regarding that individual. And it's, I don't know, it's like, it, it's almost as though they think they're being clever. When they're not being clever at all. Because every time they try to be clever, they also think they need to slap us in the face with what they're saying. Yeah. And there's no room for subtlety. They think they're being subtle, but then the next line, they literally tell us what's happening. And there's a really great example of that in this episode, which we'll get to, um, where they tell us what the, what is happening at the end, about five minutes before it even comes along, because they couldn't resist just slapping us in the face with the information. Yeah. So, so Nikki says he could be in a meeting or at the movies. There's weddings, funerals, job interviews and silent retreats. And Jen says, I hope he's at all of those today. And seen then. And then we see another little montage of Jen over the next two days, just waiting for him to reply, waiting for him to reply. And it gets to Sunday. Something weird happens to her hair at the t- same time. Yeah, she goes a bit. He's weird. She's becoming a bit dishevelled. Yeah, because it, she, it... all she does is wait for this text. So... Then Sunday comes around and Jen's phone rings and we're like sitting there going, okay, of course this isn't him because we know it's not going to be him. Yeah. And you've already told us that the episode's got nothing to do with this guy. So she picks up the phone and it's Chuck Donnellan, who is Emil Blonsky's parole officer. And uh, Jen says, uh, I can't imagine you calling me on a Sunday is good news. And he says, got that right. We've got a malfunction alert on Blonsky's inhibitor. And she says, oh, did he turn into the abomination? And he says, we don't know. So I've got to go up to the wackadoo ranch of his. And she says, OK, I'll check in with him. And he goes, well, you have danced right on over to why I called. We don't have the resources for a squad of uniforms to go with me. So I was hoping you'd meet me there just in case, you know. I thought that was so pathetic. I'll tell you one of the reasons why I thought that was pathetic. This whole idea that someone can phone and say, look, I need she help for hire, please. But I'm not going to pay you. I just need you to be around me so I can't get beaten up. So what? Every time he goes to see anybody, he does this. It's just you know, it it it's doesn't matter. Ver- it doesn't matter. Versus a Hulk, you know? Yeah, but it it just it just didn't feel right. It felt yeah. it's just stupid. I could know? understand it. I could understand. He didn't it. even need to say that. They could have easily have said, "Look, um, it's it's uh, it's part of the uh, thing. We've called him and." He needs his lawyer present, or whatever. 
just to that make sure, more sense. just to make yeah. sure that things are done legally and correctly Absolutely. and all that. You don't even need to go into this. I need your help. I need you to turn into the green monster or whatever it is in order to protect me. Yeah. And it just shows that these writers don't, um, they, they have no real concept in their heads of what good storytelling is and how to connect the dots. Also, I know, I know this is a superhero show, but this shows no awareness of how law enforcement works in America. In no, America, not, yeah, there's... Not an expert. I mean, it's not about being an expert. Everyone knows that in America, everything is done at zero risk to the police as much as yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the yeah. idea that he calls someone when he's a parole officer for abomination... Yeah, and says, exactly. we don't have yeah, resources yeah. for a squad of uniforms to go with me. Of course that is, they would have the... That, that would be the number one priority. Of course they would yeah. have the resources... They don't go into school shootings to stop school shootings unless they have 50 yeah, officers please, around I know, the building. It's really bad. I mean, it's terrible. A terrible thing to bring up, but yeah, it's horrible. But actually, just going back one step, the other thing that um, I think maybe have lent me to, uh, made me think this was even this is this really really poor sort of setup was that now I I I don't know what the writers of this show are like. I don't know anything about their um, private lives, but the idea that you can spend almost a week with someone and exactly all, all you know is their telephone number is bizarre. So even if you didn't, uh, if someone didn't respond, you might want to sort of go around to where they work or whatever. You might, you know, yeah. you might know them, might know where they live. I mean, how can you only know their telephone number? I don't get it. But uh, you know, what are they talking it, about all that time? I just it, think it's, it's just preposterous like, that the the writers thought. That there would be a single parole officer for abomination. Yeah, that is that is also equally stupid. Just one yeah. person who's just a one regular guy who guy. pulled the short. He, he actually pulled the pulled short straw. He's he just a regular guy, <laughs> and that, that, work. that he may have to what, go what and find <laughs> abomination released, <laughs> and that he's supposed to go sort that out on his own. Oh, that's so God, ridiculous. Yeah. Can you imagine the guy's probably come in thinking, "I'm going to have a nice, easy job. It's only a Sunday. What can happen on a Sunday?" Bloody abomination. Yeah. He just sit, he's just <laughs> and I'm on my there. own. <laughs> and what's he doing all the other times? Just sitting there having donuts or yeah, something yeah. like on his own. Anyway, so I, I think you're right. I think it would have made made a better argument for her to be there if he said, actually, we don't know what's happening. There's a malfunction. It doesn't mean that anything has definitely gone wrong, but it'd be good to have the lawyer present. In case, in case yeah, you know. Yeah, and, and that, I think that is fair. I mean, fair enough. Uh, and I, I can also understand someone who is alone, if we if we say that that's what the world is, that he's a lone parole officer, also calling and saying, actually, if she is a parole officer and she is She-Hulk, you know, she may be of assistance if he is abomination to me. And he says it himself. He says, my chances of staying out of, of, staying out of the ICU would be much yeah. greater if I had a Hulk with me. And she basically agrees. And he says, I'm not interrupting your plans, am I? And she goes, begrudging, in a sad way, she kind of goes, no, not at all, nope, I will he's see you there. waiting for a text. Because she wants plans with uh, Josh, and uh, he's not texted her back. So, and then he says, great, because the place is full of weirdos, and I don't want to be, and then he sings along to radio, yeah. and then basically, next thing we know is uh, Jen pulls up to the gate. And, Meets uh, him. Yeah, she she actually drives straight through the gate without properly, <laughs> <laughs> properly talking to him. And uh, she just, he goes, hey, Jen, 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 wait, wait, wait for me. And she just doesn't care. She just drives straight through the gates into this place where technically yeah. abomination could yeah, be running yeah, wild. Well, well, yeah, exactly. And other weirdos are apparently there as well. And she's in a human form, so yeah. it could yeah. be a danger to her. But she doesn't seem to care because she's Jen. And uh, Chuck then says, hey, Jen, thanks again for doing this. And he said, uh, yeah, I mean, if he's violated his parole, his, his lawyer should be here. So now, now I've said that, yeah. So now they say it, but before, he should have said that before when he yeah, called her. Exactly, exactly. So th now this is the issue because when he called her, he's saying, I need protection. And now he's saying the real reason, which, is, which makes far more sense, which is that if he's violated his parole, the lawyer should be there. Yeah. Not, thanks for coming... You know, I'm super scared and I'm glad yeah. that nothing's going to happen. So then Jen, so they've already forgotten what they've said. Yeah, yeah, they're completely... Is, well, they've said, no, no. He, he does then ask her to Hulk up or something or put in a green suit or whatever it is. He uses. Yeah, but... 
even but, then, yeah, like, they're losing really, track. They're the losing main track. Reason, the main and, I, and I think, and I think that if they had started, as I said, we're talking about you need a lawyer there. If he had then said the next time that you're going to say, I think it would have actually had better power mm. in terms of the scene. It would have been a better uh, way of sort of building up to that scene. But no, these writers just don't get it. Yeah, and then so basically, Jen starts honking the horn in a car, and. He goes, no, Jen, Jen. And she goes, are you here, Blonsky? Yeah, they try to call out Blonsky to find out where he is. That's it. And Chuck says, you're honking your horn at a 10-foot tall lizard monster, so maybe put on your green suit. And she goes, put on my green suit? And he says, yeah, you get big Jolly Green yourself. And Jolly Green Giant. Jolly Green Giant, yeah. For a second, I thought she was going to put put a hand in the pocket and give him some sweet corn. Yeah, yeah. Jolly Green Giant is really not a stretch at all. And... um, then she says, uh, he says, what do you call it? And she goes, hulking out. And he goes, okay, good, whatever. Then would you please? And uh, she hulks out. She turns yeah. into Jen. The thing I've yeah, noticed about transition her, in this one, I think. Yeah, it's the, the first thing I've time. noticed about her, the transitions in this episode is that they don't, sh- they're not quite fluid. So you kind of see the beginning of it, where she t- she's turning, and you see the end. But in the middle, where she's going from Jen to Hulk, She-Hulk, I think a, you see her. It's also that you see her face go green and that partially green. Yeah, it goes a and then it's blurry, and, it goes straight and then to the, suddenly goes to the it's a bit end. Weird. It's almost like somebody's taking a crayon or something and it's, said, "Right, okay." It's definitely not a smooth animation. Yeah. And um, there's something weird about it. It's I just a bit feel weird. Like... And they did it a couple of times, I think, wasn't it? And yeah. It, it is. Yeah, I think I think it is strange because in all the previous episodes, you either see her as Jen or as Hulk, She Hulk. Yeah. Uh, with no transition. Here they try to so show some transition and it's almost like they, they've they run out of money some, on the budget. Yeah, I think they have done some transitions in the other episodes, but it wasn't... Those ones were better than these ones, for sure. Well, they certainly didn't stick out in the way that it, this that was sticking these out ones because did, yeah. it was so poor. Yeah, and I think the other thing to just mention is is that I know people will think, oh, well, this is just a TV show. Why are you being so mean on the animation? But at the end of the day... She's the star of the TV show. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they have it's a multi billion dollar company. So they should be able to do this one thing correctly. If anything, the one thing they should be doing in this show, animation wise, that is correct, is the transformation from Jen to She Hulk. Yeah, because that's agreed. the most important part of the whole character. Yeah, I'm agreeing. So then we cut to Emil Blonsky, Tim Roth is back. He's sitting on a sort of sofa bed thing, sofa chair. On a little deck. Well, it's good to see Tim Ross back. To be honest, Tim Ross was when he in that one ep- in, the, in the episode with uh, where he um, was in prison. Two. Episode he, he three. Was, yeah, episode he three. was easy. The best thing about that episode, and he he, he was playing. He's, he's acting. He's such a good actor. He's look. He's acting. He's not even. He's just. He's just acting. He doesn't have to try that he hard. Does, he's does not he? trying at all. You can because tell it's just it doing is, it easy. Though. He looked at the script and thought, "What a load of crap! I'm just going to." Play, yeah. you know, like this, and he's playing it like a hippie, basically. You really can tell that he just literally just turned up and said, "I'll just do whatever you need me to do," yeah. and he just did it. It wasn't a stretch for him at all. And I think some of the lines he actually just said them as he believed they should be said. Not he didn't read the script. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, there's a line uh, yeah. later where he uses the word knackered, which yeah. I'm sure uh, the Americans, Americans would, would, Americans would that, never yeah. have written that. So, yeah. so let's just. Uh, Cut to what Chuck says. So Chuck's examining his inhibitor and says it's definitely malfunctioning. And his inhibitor is a bit different to Bruce's because his is more of like an anklet, like a yeah, you know, basically uh, one of these trackers that you normally get, you know, for criminals who uh, yeah, rather than uh, Bruce's nice one, which is more of a bracelet, you know, a, bracelet so, a watch or something. So he's got this anklet which is malfunctioning, and um, Emil says, I don't know why. And he says, maybe you might have jostled it. And he says, well, come to think of it, I did get a jolt from an electric electric fence earlier, but it was worth it because my favourite chicken, Princess Silk Feather, was stuck. And they start talking about favourite chickens. The other thing I just want to mention in this scene is that Jen is in the background. And she as literally, She-Hulk. As, as She-Hulk. She-Hulk. And she literally looks like a cardboard cutout. Yeah, yeah. it is a bit weird. She just She's just standing there with a, basically the... She's as tall as the room uh, is high, and she's she's kind of is a slight crouch, and it looks it it does look a bit weird in that it looks like it's a cardboard cutter. She looks two D. She really looks two D in that yeah. scene. Yeah. But then they do a little bit later where she she looks a bit better. So. Yeah, they, should, they do. So then Chuck says, "I've recalibrated your inhibitor, 
and she's good to go. And he says, so stay away from the electric fence, maybe. And uh, then he says, so then I won't have to make any more scary trips up here. Not that I don't like coming here. And yeah, Emil says, yeah, come back anytime. And that's the whole of Chuck for this whole episode. That's it, yeah, that's it. God knows Chuck's why come we come and him. gone, come and yeah, gone. He could have just called, you know, really, honestly, he could have just called Jen and said, hey, your client's inhibitor seems to be playing up. Can you just go check it out? Yeah. We didn't really need him. I guess I guess they are just justifying that Jen would have known what to do with inhibitor. Yeah, if it was yeah exactly. Apparently women don't know things like that, which, you know, but they know everything else. I, I mean, it's fair enough to say that someone with expertise should be involved in the episode, but I just felt like, what a throwaway character. Yeah. Well, there's only so much what, you can do with a, a role like character. that. Yeah. You know, Emil could have called her and said, there's something up with my inhibitor. She could have just come down with this random guy called Chuck. We didn't even have to know anything about him. And he just sorted it out. But anyway, Chuck's on his bit. So they're walking back to the car. And Emil's just commenting. They're yeah, walking back to uh, Jen's car. Jen's car, yeah. And Emil's just commenting to Jen saying, oh, you, Chuck's always in such a hurry to leave. And uh, Jen says, well, he thought he was here to face the abomination. And Emil says, well, what about you then, Jen? And uh, she said, I thought you worked I thought you worked hard to get out of prison and you'd be really dumb to go back in. Yeah. And he goes, true that. And true that is definitely him just saying whatever. So. Because yeah. true that is such a British thing to say. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that he just said that naturally. And here we go. We're starting to get into the episode finally. Yeah. And we'll see if the episode's worth watching, but... We'll, t- we'll talk about whether the episode was worth watching or whether this was fruitful, but now we start to get to the crux of the main part of the episode, and that is when we see Manbull and Aguila? El Aguila? Aguila, yeah. Who enter the scene and start fighting. And they're fighting each other, and they basically smash up Jen's car. Yeah. So Manbull is basically a man with horns, Aguila is uh, a Spanish guy dressed up as a matador or a a squashbuckler, calls himself a squashbuckler, and they're walking, and Jen is walking towards the car, and these two guys are fighting in the, the, uh, and they're running, and Manbull ends up running towards the Spanish guy who evades him, and Manbull smashes into the car and basically makes it undrivable. Yeah. So, and well summed up. Yeah, and then... And then, basically, Jen says, what the hell's going on? Yeah, and... <laughs> Which she, is also yeah. what we are thinking yeah, in this we, episode. I mean, to be honest, he did, there were mentions of weirdos there, and you're thinking, well, who are these weirdos yeah. at the time? So, Manbull, um, because he looks like a blooming bull, I mean, they've given him a, a weird pig nose, but it's actually... Yeah, it's a, a, he it's doesn't a weird look much nose. like a bull, actually. No, apart from yeah. the horns, he doesn't really look like a bull. It looks more like a pig, but, um, you know, you think, okay, maybe they're superheroes. Maybe they're not. Who knows? Mm. Um, but then Jen, in order to deal with these two guys, changes into She-Hulk and subdues Manbull, I think, isn't it? Uh, That's just it. Up, and, and then Emil does the introductions. Yeah, so th- you're right. So basically, Manbull says, uh, well, they introduce each other. They said, Brother Blonsky taught me a lot about taking responsibility for my anger. After Jen says, I'll feel better when you apologise to my Prius. Yeah, um, with money. Yeah, with money. Yeah. And then you ha- they, you, we find out the names, Manbull and El Aguila. And El Aguila says, before we make any assumptions, no, I'm not a matador. And he said, that would make the two of us fighting pretty cliche, which of course it is. Yeah. And... Emil says they're working through identity issues and El Aguila says, I don't have issues. And Emil says, all right. And El Aguila says, I know exactly who I am. I am a swashbuckler. Yeah, swashbuckler. And I think they... As in Errol Flynn. <laughs> they probably thought this was funny. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. But I think the key thing here is that um, Tim Roth actually has effectively indicated what his retreat is about. It's about people looking in, inwards and finding themselves and and identifying themselves in That's the right it, yeah. way. And he's, um, he's trying to 
let people understand who they really are. Yeah. And he says, he, for, it's a good example, he says, you see, to, Ma- to Manbo, El Aguila represents every person who's tried to stab him for being an affront to nature, of which there are many. Manbo says so many. And here, Jen says, this is so much unnecessary backstory to tell someone whose car oh, you God, destroyed. Yeah. And when she said that, I genuinely felt as if she was correct. Why are we being given backstory about these characters when we have no backstory for Jen? Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything about what her life was like before she became She-Hulk. Yeah. Apart from being a wonderful lawyer who naturally never saw... I mean, Ella Wheeler, later in the episode, tells us about the fact that he has studied being a matador and yeah, all this sort of stuff. Whole, you, you learn more about the other characters in this particular episode than you do about Jen. You really do, yeah. And what you do learn about Jen is that, well, well, we'll see when it's. Uh... So it, it, it's it's just absolutely crazy, and the, I I I don't understand if the writers, there's no way they knew the irony of this line when they wrote it. No, no, I I think they there's genuinely no thought it was a joke, yeah. not realizing it was the wrong type of joke because it's a joke on them, exactly. not on the actual characters. A joke on the writers themselves. So then Jen says, "I can't drive this. How am I supposed to go home?" And Emil says. You know, sometimes life presents a teacher when there's a lesson to be learned. Jen, think of this totally knackered Prius Prime as your teacher. And that him using the word knackered is definitely him. Yeah, I, I actually think that uh, it would not surprise me if that if those lines were Tim Roth just chilling out. I'm a hippie. This is what I'm going to say because he's, these are the, he's played the, this sort of stuff before. Yeah, not only that, but these kind type of lines are so. Um, it's just a caricature of a hippie on a commune yeah. saying, find yourself. It's real um, Russell, Br- Russell Brand vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what they're really going for. Yeah. And I don't, and know, I, and I don't, I don't think, think they I told him that. But... Yeah, but I don't think, I don't think the uh, writers write those lines. I think the director probably had these, they had these lines and they said, we want you to play this type of character or that type of character. Yeah. And he just said, leave it to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, said, yeah, maybe. I mean, if if they wrote it fair enough, it's, it's not like it added loads, but it is inherently very British sounding. Yeah, and and, so Tim, and Tim Ross, I can understand him like he's, reading he's, a line he's, and going. Let's I think he's enjoying. I think he's enjoying the moment when he's yeah. sort of coming out with stuff because who else is going to give him such crap lines to write uh, to read? Exactly. You know, and, and to sort of act. So then uh, they basically have a little bit more of a chat. And then he they want to move the car to the garage or the garage. And uh, he says, Manbo, give us a push to the garage, would you? And he says, do I look like a mechanic? My name is Manbo, not mechanical That was such a crap bloody joke. And then it says, they say, wow, how long have you been waiting to say that? That felt very forced, which it was. Um, It's kind of strange that even the writers at this point in the series... Have given up. (laughs) have, ...have admitted that their jokes are terrible. So now they're writing stuff like... That seemed pretty forced. <laughs> yeah. It, it, because they know it's terrible. I know. And, oh, it's just... Yeah. It's just indicative of the fact that they are struggling to find words. And then Emil says, I think it's fantastic news that the tow truck won't get here until later today. So at this point, they're walking through his property. And she's looking for a signal for a phone because she she's desperate to find out if Josh has given her a text. That's it, yeah. Nice uh, property, by the way. It looks nice. Well, I'm sure that the... Um, no, Seven but, Soul Sisters, or sure, they are. Well, no, I'm <laughs> sure that they probably went to a part of Disneyland or something and said, oh, we can use that little lot down there yeah, to actually yeah. make a little, um, you know, just a, a, an outdoor made... scene because the rest of it's all indoors. Yeah, but Emil's got good money from the Seven Soul Sisters. Yes, so. he has. He has fleeced them properly. Yeah, so Jen says, how is that fantastic news? And he says, well, it means you can spend some time here. You know, relax. And she says, is there a soul reception here? And he says, no. So then he talks about the fact that he has a wood lodge where he offers private spiritual consultation and life coaching. And then he says exclusive to our Platinum Circle members, which is very American. And it's more of this sort of like yoga mindfulness retreat. And he sees some of his chickens. Then he jokingly says to Jen, you've got a text. And she says, did I? And he goes, yeah. And then she goes, where? Very funny. So he he's obviously showing that he knows She's just glued to her phone. Yeah. He's recognised it. He's making a... He's got a bit of banter with her. 
And he said, in our ceremonial sweat yurt, we integrate the past and the present into one being. And he basically says, I'll pick you up in 20 minutes. And she says, no, I'm not sweating it out in a yurt today. I need to get some work done. I mean, why is she lying to him and saying I need to get work done? She's just waiting for a text from a guy. Yeah, exactly. But for some reason, she feels like she can't tell him at this point. She says, I need to get some work done. And he said, if you could get me a desk and some Wi-Fi. He says, that's a bit of a hard ask. I don't think they... I, I think they generally wanted to show her as a hard-working woman. Yeah. Not not the fact that she's actually waiting for a text, but just want to admit it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is, it was really like throwaway line. And uh, he says, um, we don't have Wi-Fi. We don't carry it as a policy. And he says, distractions from the outside world and all that sort of stuff. And she says, uh, you have no rece- said, and you have no reception anywhere either. So she goes, this isn't how I want to spend my day. And he said, maybe it's how you need to spend your day. And she just ignores him and says, I'm going to find a signal. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's really strange because one thing I thought about this scene was it really isn't in keeping with the fact that Jen is actually a relatively caring person. Like she does seem to care a little bit. And in this scene, she's just completely ignoring everything he's saying to her. Yeah. She, she's not being the warm person that she's trying to yeah. sort of present herself in the previous episodes. And I know that they're trying to present us with this idea that all she cares about is a text back from Josh and that she's so fixated on this. But really, there's no real person... Who, who would go to a yoga retreat and just completely ignore the person that they went to, yeah. especially when they actually have a relationship with that person, which by which she's actually got this guy out of prison. Yeah, and also he's paying her bills. So basically yeah. she's a client. But the, he's I, a client. the idea that she wouldn't engage in any sort of friendly conversation at all with yeah, him, yeah. and that just she doesn't recognise that he's just another human being, you know, it really doesn't fit with the character of Jen and either she is somewhat broken and we don't know about it and that she's got this sort of personality where she's a little bit self-centered and she just cares about what's going on in her own life or they've just not written her correctly sadly I think and they're right. so busy yeah. trying to show us that the main thing of the whole show is that she's waiting for the text she's waiting for this text she's waiting for this text You've already shown us that in a montage. Yeah, yeah. You've already told us that with the words that she's saying. And now you're trying to show it again with her ignoring Emil Blonsky, but you don't need to do that. That's not how people are. She could easily have been engaged in a conversation, but have a f- constantly looking at her phone without yeah, saying anything. You, exactly. And he would have then... And there are lots of really good ways to sort of form the basis of what happens next. But these guys are just so lazy. They, they, you're absolutely correct. They could, they could be having a conversation, and she could be checking her phone and still responding to him, and he can still realize that she is checking her phone constantly, even though she's giving appropriate answers to what he's saying and and striking up some general conversation. But no, she has to be extending her arm as far as she possibly can, yeah, yeah. and just looking at her signal bar to see if the signal is coming. I'm pretty sure this is because they've aimed this at five-year-olds, because otherwise five-year-olds would struggle to understand what's going on. Um, I think they've aimed it at people with short-term memory loss. <laughs> I really do. Because <laughs> every five seconds they've got to remind us what they already told us. Yes. Or either that or they've got short-term memory loss. But, um, yeah, so, so Emil recognises that she's not interested in what he's saying and says, clearly you're not in a teachable mood right now and I do respect that. So, I'm around if you need me. Then, Jen busts into the hut. Which and is she's the looking for a si- members. Yeah, she's looking for this signal that she can finally get. And, and she gets signal and she goes, oh, hell yes. Yeah, she, she gets in a, in this... Um, in, it's not really a hut. It's a very, very plush room, basically. It's like a... A, lo- a very plush lodge, and she walks in. Oh, I've got a signal, and of course, as one could imagine, there's Emil there w- doing a group session with the other uh, with four, and I put it in quotes weirdos. Who knows, yeah. who knows what they are? And it and it's um it's the wood lodge that he says yeah. where he offers the private spiritual consultation and life coaching, 
and it's kind of that platinum circle member um sort of session yeah and at the back it says a bomb must stay yeah I know. and uh, i was like That's i think it actually makes more sense to call it a bomb it must stay <laughs> but uh fair enough they they had to print out a card to make something interesting and um Jen has busted in, and this is when we learn who the other people in the circle are. So this is the quote-unquote weirdos that Chuck mentioned. And um, we have Ella Guila and Manbull, who we've already met. And then we have Porcupine. He's a porcupine. That's the show. Yeah, he's in a porcupine. Yeah, he's a guy in a... It's a, it's, actually quite actually, it's a guy in a, a porcupine suit. Um, a gas mask. And I must admit, I thought they would have... Why didn't they call him skunk? In order, no, I I would have liked to them have have made it a woman. So at least they've got three men and a woman in this session, rather than it's always it's all men. men isn't it? it's, all it's all men. men. Yeah. It's all men are always the ones who have got you the know problems. Why? Because women aren't allowed to be weirdos. Yeah, in this particular. When you series. refer to them a group as weirdos, they can only be men. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we've got <laughs> porcupine, and then we've got a Saracen, who's a a dude who thinks he's a vampire. A vampire. And Saracen is the guy. Whose lines I think really show how weak this show is, and we'll talk about it once we get to it. And Jen says, "Wow, this is quite a group." And he says, "You're welcome to join." And she says, "I'll pass. I'm just going to work over here in the one square meter of this property that actually has reception." And he says, "Okay." So now we kind of see while she's in the background, we see a little bit of uh, the group discussion, and. Jim Roth um, basically says, last session we really explored Alejandro's struggles with his identity and he says, just because I'm Spanish and I have a flair for that style, people constantly assume that I'm a matador. It's dehumanising. Matadors are human. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's but, but one, of, one of the things about this particular scene, is it's actually really weird. This is a completely superfluous episode in the entire series. However, as a scene, when that group session is being done with Tim Roth and, you know, she held, or she's not, Jen is in the background, not saying anything. It's probably one of the better scenes in the whole Bloomin' series, the way it's played out. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, you know, the actors are actually doing their thing. You know, you're seeing some, you're seeing some banter. But the writing is still weak. Like the next line, it says, the porcupine says, Spanish is a language, not a nationality. So, and what is I know, what a stupid blooming... Li- yeah, exactly. You're just trying to show that he's stupid He's or stupid, yeah, yeah. We're just trying to show that men are stupid. And it's just so ridiculous. And you don't need to put these lines in. These people know yeah, each other. They yeah. have, they've already formed a relationship. They are a group. Exactly. So they don't need to be there throwing ridiculous lines at each other. They can just be a support group. That's right. And that would be fine. But And no. it could be funny still. It can Absolutely. still be funny. But... I think the I think the problem is these writers have very limited experience of wor- of the world we live in. So as a result, they don't really see that that what they what they're looking at is effectively um, a scene that they have in their heads. They've just sort of playing it out like a caricature. That's it. They've never been and, in group therapy. Yeah, yeah. Or they may well have been, but the point Definitely is they have not. no idea of um, you know of of. Of, of, of these type of things and th- they've effectively taken an extreme in terms of being a caricature but you know what if you actually look at a lot of the background of, of She-Hulk and how it's formed and all these people who have been uh, sort of talking about this and the other Marvel products they're trying to get away from doing caricatures and yet here that's exactly what they're doing you know, the things that they're trying to get away from they're actually effectively doing and it's so pathetic yeah and then basically Ella Guila just talks a little bit more about how he is annoyed that people see him as a matador. And then he says, I did do some light matadoring in college. I wish I knew what Jen did at college. Yeah, yeah. You don't know anything about Jen, but you, you know a hell of a lot about these other people. It's like ridiculous. Well, good I, I already know more about Ella Guila than I do about Jen. And it's been about three minutes. Yeah. And uh, Manbull says, oh my God, dude, what? And... Uh, then there's this whole thing where we say we have to guard against codependency and man bull and El Aguila are seen as codependent because it's a bull and a matador. And, uh, they start, I thought that was quite funny for us. Well, they start referring to themselves as like our relationship and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And uh, Saracen says, 
I'd like to say something. Um, they have been spending a lot of time together. I'm feeling like maybe it's not healthy. And basically, what we're learning is that Ella Gui and Manbul are in a relationship with each other well, without realizing. Without it's not a formal relationship, but they they're in some sort of uh, tight bond, yeah. which is beyond what the bonding in the group would be. Yeah. And uh, so there is a level of codependency, and um, Porcupine basically says, uh, "I feel like it maybe it's not healthy," and then. Emil says to Porcupine, you know, we've talked about vulnerability and how important it is to to the process. And he says, how about you take off your suit? That would be a really good first step. And Porcupine says, uh, I just feel safer with it on. So he doesn't take it off. And then in comes low level bad guy from yeah. episode four. Yeah, he breaks that into three. the fourth sort of. You know, this is, this is when Jen talks to the camera. This is the wall break, yeah. yeah. So the one-fourth wall break per episode, this is the one that we get. And um, Jen says, uh, no way. And she says, that guy's here? You probably don't even remember who he is. And then we have a little flashback and we remember that this is one of the guys who attacked her in the alleyway. And he was carrying some sort of like mace, like magic mace sort of thing. Yeah, some electronic device. Yeah. And uh, he's one of the guys who tried to get her blood. So she gets angry, she hulks out, and she walks over to the room. And um, when she's walking over to the room and she's hulking out, I really thought we were in the middle of a PlayStation game, because it was really bad animation. It was very, like, choppy and just... It wasn't fluid at all. And then she throws him into some chairs. And my God, is this guy resilient, because a Hulk just threw you into some chairs. And he wasn't too badly hurt. No, he wasn't. So either she is uh, able to control her anger perfectly or they have really underestimated how strong a Hulk is in this episode. So here's the thing. Wrecker says... Uh, I'm trying to try and get to where we are. So he's, he's called Wrecker and um, Jennifer throws him into the chairs and then I think Manbull says, Oh, I stacked those. And yeah, they're trying to be funny. It's not funny. It's just pathetic, yeah, really. Uh, yeah, and then Manbo says, I'm allowed to be angry because people are saying, oh, it's cool, let it go, don't worry about it. And uh, Jen says, this arsehole and his friends attacked me behind my apartment. She just used the word arsehole? Yeah, she said this ar- arsehole, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And then, uh, yes, yeah, so you won word because you're allowed five- to use. Well, it's aimed at five-year-olds, isn't it? So you yeah. wouldn't have thought that well, they'd use any word like that. Who knows who it's aimed at? I think it's aimed at people with short-term memory loss, who are <laughs> the age of three, but also women who are single. Yeah. Um, if who knows. And, well, I, d- uh, I don't know about women who are single. I think pe- I think women who are single who... In their mid-40s. I, I, d- I, d- I don't know. I, d- I, d- I, don't I think used to think mid-30s, at... now I'm starting to think mid-40s. I think, I think it's just aimed at people who... Um, I don't know. They, who, when they look in the mirror, just want to say, why is everyone like me? Anyway, go on. That's what it is. Just struggling people. And uh, so Emil says, yeah, Jennifer, darling, I'm going to need you to sit in a calming chair right now. And um, they all kind of get worked up about the fact that this has happened. And um, she Which is says, fair enough, because guess what? Yeah. She just attacked a guy who walked into the room. <laughs> and then she says, once I'm out of there, I'm going to rip this guy to shreds. And uh, they say, hold on, that's not how we work her through our issues around here. And... They say, well, let's welcome her to the circle. So Jen gets her own chair and she is welcomed to the circle. And basically, Emil says, I'd love to work through our issues. Oh, right. So Rekka says, I'd love to work through our issues if you let me. And he talks a little bit and and basically we get to a point where he says, so I realise real strength comes from looking in the mirror and saying, hey, man, I'm going to work on me. I don't need a magic crowbar to give me a false sense of power. All it did was make me and my boys act like idiots, rolling up on you like we were something, some supervillains or something. And she said, you attacked a woman four to one. You absolutely were supervillains. I think it's fair enough. And he says, I hear you, Jen, and I take radical accountability for my actions. And I'm very sorry. And she hits him with some sarcasm she says uh, oh my god seems like a breakthrough he's so sorry 
and uh, this is recognized by by uh, Emil Blonsky who says sarcasm and then um, El Aguila says wow Hennifer clearly has some stuff going on and she'd rather sit here getting her kicks listening to us than working on herself and she says I'm not getting my kicks and I'm fine and everyone basically goes you just threw a guy across a chair into perfectly stacked chairs mm. and everyone else is shared and Emil says, so is there anything you want to get off your chest? And Emil says, look at you, you're glued to your phone, basically. So she's still looking at her phone, so you're yeah. glued to that thing. Yeah. And then Jen takes a minute and she finally contributes to the group. Yeah, she puts the phone to one side. Of course this was going to happen. Yeah, we yeah, literally we knew, we knew, knew this was going to happen. happen. Yeah, yeah. So now we're just getting to the bottom of how Jen's feeling. She says, I met this guy, Josh, at a wedding. We went on a few dates. I thought it was going great. And then I haven't heard from him. And now I can't think, stop thinking about it. And someone says, when was the last time you talked to him? And she says, three nights ago, when we, so basically when we slept together. And he's, as someone said, oh, are you two married? And uh, I think that's more about the codependency between man, bull, and Aguila. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on in this scene. And basically, they... I have to make El Aguila or Manbull switch seats with someone because there's too much codependency going on. And then we go back to Jen and Emil says, so, how, so they say, how many dates? And Jen says, three. And someone says, when the, what was the last thing you texted him? And she goes, that was fun. I can't stop smiling. And everyone goes, oh my God, yikes. What? Yeah. And, you know, not that I didn't find it that cringy. I didn't find it that cringy either. People are finding this extremely cringy for whatever reason. <laughs> And Porcupine says, it's thirsty and a cliché. And she says, you're thirsty and a cliché. And, uh, okay, so come back. It wasn't necessarily that funny. And um, basically, after cutting a long story short, because the scene is all about how she she messaged him again. It's all of a few seconds of a few a little bit yeah. of banter between the different characters. Um, she says all she messaged him again and said, hey, I'm getting a little worried, just want to know yeah. you're okay. And she puts a blushing smile emoji. And then again, everyone's like, oh my God, that's so cringe. And I think this is the crux of the scene, is when the Wrecker guy, who's the, the, the ex-supervillain, says, we have to consider the very real possibility that you were ghosted. Ghosted, yeah, exactly. Now, everyone knew this was the case from the beginning of the episode. And nobody's willing to say it. And now they have slapped us in the face with this again. And it's just a bit. I mean, I mean, her, her friend should have said that at the very beginning. Exactly. Twelve hours, no reply. You've been ghosted. That is a bit of a while, isn't it? Yeah. But the thing is, is that. It, okay, fine. I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll let it slide, and I'll say that you can she argue wasn't that willing to come to the come self to, realization. Yeah, 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 yeah. Own. She needed someone. And to she tell needed her. someone to tell her, and it was nice that the guy who was this ex villain said it to her. Even though Tim Roth probably could have said it to her as soon as she... Exactly, up. yeah. So, fine. We'll we'll let that pass. Now, where did we get to? So, she, she talks about the it, fact... Yeah. So, they say this, she talks about the fact that... the And the reason she cares so much about this is because he liked Jen for Jen. So, he said, she says, he didn't ask me about She-Hulk. And then she starts talking about this, this thing where she's comparing She-Hulk and, you know, friends in high school. So, she says... You know, in high school, that friend that you have that's like cooler than you are, more attractive, athletic, they get all the attention from everyone. She says, you think life would be so much easier if I were that person and I could turn to that person anytime I want to. And everyone pays attention when I'm this, like my colleagues, my boss, but and even guys. And she says, but it feels like cheating because would they like me if I didn't have all of this? Like, if I was just Jen, would the same guys who like She-Hulk stick around for Jen? Because some of them don't. And um, she says, and that sucks for Jen, because Jen is great, and no one cares when they're She-Hulk. So she she says, so I'll I'll meet this guy who actually likes Jen, and that just felt good, you know, to to know that. And uh, then he ghosts me, and it sucks. And... um, I think like the people in the circle are kind of feeling for her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, what do we think about this line? So she's basically saying that she doesn't, she doesn't feel like She Hulk is her. 
No, no, I think what it is is, and the way I the way I read it was that in all the previous episodes, it was like, I'm Jen. This other character is somebody I control, I can create, and it's just effectively I'm the one that's dominant. But in this particular scene, she kind of is saying, well, actually, it's she, she Hulk is the dominant yeah. one, and but Jen is the not so dominant one. And I, yeah. I thought, I thought the reality is, you know, yes, you're gonna have that. You, at some point in time in this series, this had to be said, because who the hell is going to look at her and not think of She Hulk? And when She-Hulk is there, She-Hulk is going to have a thousand people looking at her. Whereas when she's on her own as Jen, you'd, she, she won't even be noticed in the room. So this is the episode where, and I told you this, in the, I think, in the last episode or the one before maybe. But I, the arc that I thought was going to happen where you just say, listen, it's not about She-Hulk. Jen is perfect. And you just need to look inside and realise that you are Jen and you're great. This is what I knew that this was yeah, happening yeah, in this yeah. episode. This is what, yeah, exactly, exactly. But the problem is, is that the arc has not been done in a smooth way. No. Because if you remember the previous episode where she goes to the wedding, she's so excited to go as She-Hulk. She-Hulk, I know. So I she know. actually, and so the last two episodes, what's happened is she's embraced the name She-Hulk. She's won a court case so that she can beat She-Hulk. She then wants to be She-Hulk. She goes to a wedding and is disappointed when someone says, please don't be She-Hulk. And now she's saying, oh, it was more important for me to be Jen the whole time. And it's like, why didn't you do this in a smooth fashion where we could understand that when you are She-Hulk, you feel like Jen's missing out. Yeah, yeah. She yeah. should, And I know they did that. They, they basically did that at the end of the wedding thing where Josh says, I like Jen for Jen. But she didn't really make it clear that she's not a fan of the fact that She-Hulk is getting attention and Jen is not. But the way they did it in the wedding episode was, it was cringeworthy. The way that he, they, every every line that Josh said was along the lines of, oh, I like you for what you are. And that isn't right either. You know, you, know, you just know that it's, it's just weird. It, and and they're saying it like that in order to obviously he's going to be with the bad guy, which we're going to about find out. But I don't know this whole the whole thing is just like a whole episode just to get down to this one line that they could have had in any one of the previous episodes. Yeah, exactly. But you know they need to fill time. They need to fill episodes. So this. Is but I wanted Daredevil. This is why they have this episode. But this is why they have this episode is just to fill an episode really, and and there's not. There's really not much in this episode that really progressed the story. Well, let's and just what get... they do is at the end of each episode they try and make something big happen. So, right? so in this scene, you've got Jen now, and she's she's in the form of She Hulk, and she's she's opened her heart to the she's crowd. She's opened her she? heart to, to, to the and group. then they all get angry because they realize that they care about her. They say, "Screw this guy! Where does he live? Let's kill him! He's yeah. got to die!" Yeah, and basically they overreact and then... yeah. They all want to kill Josh. The wrecker, the wrecker comes back and says, uh, you know... Um, delete the number. Yeah. Was he the they, one who said delete yeah, the number? Yeah, they, they, they come back and, and they say, listen, Jen is hurting. All, can, all we can offer is violence. Does anyone think they can speak to Jen's pain with the tools that we've learned in this group? That's what Emil says. Oh, so Emil says, yeah, and, the Tim Ross uh, character. And, and then Porcupine, I think, says, one thing I'd say is you can't control what others do. And... Someone I think said, I think the I think the I think the writers have got a help yourself uh, in a self help book, self -help book yeah. and they sort of let, what 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 are the key lines they, they sort of say this is like I said this is just therapy for the writers this whole show is self therapy for writers yeah and this this episode in particular really shows that they've got their own trauma that they're dealing with <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're really they're really starting to use some basic generic lines like yeah. someone's written. So one of the lines is, it hurts when someone rejects us because it reminds us of the times we reject ourselves. Yeah. And then someone said, uh, yeah, maybe this Josh thing hurts so much because you haven't been spending enough time with Jen. And someone says, yeah, that's a shame because I bet Jen is pretty damn great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And someone says, yeah, and then he goes, and then, then the vampire goes, and tasty. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, <laughs> they had to throw in a line like that because you know what? They have to pretend they can be humorous as well. That's it, yeah. So, I'm not to. I'm not going to go through all the lines. No, no, it's not worth it. But it, the point is, it, it gets to the point where she actually deletes the number. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. She deletes the number. Which and, is a bit uh, weird. Can I tell you one of the strange things? 
I, 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 and, that, and that was the end of the scene, basically, when she deletes the number. And yeah. sort of, um, one of the things I actually you, you wanted... You know what? One thing, I'm just going to bring up. The one thing that hasn't isn't in the script, which definitely happened in this episode, is the one thing I want to talk about that the vampire guy does. What's that? The vampire guy says... So... So uh, Rekka says that we have to think about the fact that he ghosted you. Yeah. And the vampire guy says, or stole your blood. Blood, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And as if, like, that was the biggest slap in the face to every fan that was watching to say, you are so stupid. Yeah. You are so stupid that you will not understand what has been happening for the last six episodes of this series. Yeah. Which is that someone tried to stab Jen. Yeah, tried to steal their blood. Didn't work. Then we had creepy guys intermittently throughout episodes. And at the end of the last episode, yeah. we had literally a big briefcase with a big stabby machine. Yeah, 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 yeah. And here this guy comes and sleeps with her and doesn't text her back. Yeah. And we don't think that maybe he's just taking her blood. Yeah, 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 exactly. The fact that a vampire guy had to say it, one shows... That they wrote the whole vampire character just to, just to say that just line. to say that line. I know it's terrible, isn't it? Yeah, it couldn't be the fact that they wanted to maybe introduce Blade into the universe. Yeah, no, it just. It... I tell you, one of the things that I was hoping would happen. Also, I... he must be a daywalker. So well, he's not. He's not a vampire. He's, he's the like, original. He's, 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 he's the vamp- original Blade. Yeah, no, he's not a vampire. But I'm the going point, to get the it. point is, the point, the one of the things I wanted, I really would have. Again, is me with my desire to see Daredevil in this blooming episode that I thought we were going to be seeing. Um, Daredevil's clever guy. The Daredevil series is very clever. And I thought, you know what? They might just turn this. And she's suddenly found herself up against it, finding a guy who attacked her. Maybe she'd ask why. Why me? What happened? And then she'd realise there's somebody behind the attack. But no. Yeah. Not interested. Nothing. Yeah. Not interested. Oh, you attacked me. Oh, that's a fine. Fine, then. yeah. Fine. Didn't ask right. him any questions. Who yeah. could, who asked you to attack me? What, what? do they yeah. want? Why were you trying to attack me? Nothing uh, important yeah. to ask Just you. why me? Yeah. And actually, it wasn't... It was, yeah, attack, it was Jen. It was actually Jen there. Jen, after. yeah. So, with magical weapons. Yeah, with magical weapons. What was so important about me that yeah. you felt like you needed to attack me? Exactly. Who's orchestrated this attack? All these really you important questions. You knew who questions. I was, yeah. All this stuff. Could have asked... Don't worry just, about it. I threw. I got my back. I threw him into a chair. Yeah, yeah. Just pathetic. Don't need though. to ask him any more so questions. So sad. So sad. They had this wonderful. She's opportunity. a lawyer. She questions people for a living. A lawyer with zero, zero she curiosity. She didn't have any curiosity about why someone tried to attack her. It's bizarre. It's no, just no, bizarre. Are they going to come back for me? The reality is... Of... Are there more people coming? Yeah, the, the reality is obviously they're worried about the fact that they want to make this a 20-minute episode and not a 30-minute episode. Yeah, but like, you have introduced a website where people are constantly making death threats. I know, I Someone know. is literally trying to put a hit out on her. And you, he she might even know something guy, about that She finds website. the guy who literally tried to attack her and, yeah. said, and doesn't ask him any questions. I know, I know. So, okay, so at the end of the scene, there's some resolution... Because Jen deletes the number. And Jen says, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm hurting for a yurtin. Yeah, they go back to and that. And then she goes they? into the yurt and... Uh, so this is where the sweat, the, the, the sweat, the, the sauna, basically. She sweats Josh out of her. Yeah. <laughs> she just, and, and I must admit, out, this whole idea, this whole idea of you solve the problem by deleting his number, I thought was really stupid, personally. I don't know anyone who would do that because it's I only hope texted her later. Yeah, it, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about this. She, this is a twelve-hour. No, it's, a, it's about three. It's been over a weekend, isn't it? So over days. over a weekend. So would you delete that number within just two or three days? What does that say about how you think about relationships and all the rest of it? What was if he was hit by a car? And we know that obviously, you know, it's, we we know there's stuff going on, but the um. It just seemed bizarre that you just allow strangers to say, delete it. And you just say, okay, or delete it. Yeah. I mean, gosh, what's this show? This writing. So she comes out of the yurt and she gives the thumbs up. Jen is cured. Cured. Of all of her yeah. insecurities. She's totally over Josh. That's the thumb up. And uh, the trailers come along to take the car away. Yeah. So And she says to the guys, she said, I'll never forget any of you, honestly. And um, they said, oh, bye, Jen. We love Jen and She-Hulk. And uh, 
and he all says, we do, and they say, the gang, and he says, you know, it says gang, but not a literal gang. Yes, Just make yes. sure you make that clear to the yeah. parole board. Bro. That was the one funny line. Tim Ross did that himself, that I, I tell you. I really yeah. think he did. Yeah, I, 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 think t- I think Tim Ross is looking at this script and thinking, what a load of crap. And he's injecting a little bit of British humour into in into this a little bit of sarcasm he, he, he's just doing that because what else is he supposed to do because none of his stuff could be taken seriously yeah and uh, uh, gosh it was the funniest line it was the it was one funny line that i found in the whole episode yeah um, but i shouldn't have to sit through 18 minutes to get one funny right line. right at the very end especially yeah. when it's pitched as a comedy yeah or a sitcom whichever you want to choose it as because the show still doesn't know what it is either and um Again, so the guys, they apologise to her, they say, sorry about the car, and she goes, yeah, that's okay, and they say, you stay, stay out of trouble, and um, they say, you know, Tim Ross says, and Jen, next time you think of Josh, remember, everyone we meet, no matter how much they hurt you, is a lesson learned. And she goes, yep, despite those platitudes, I'm happy that I stuck around. And he says, feel free to come again, and she goes, not till you get Wi-Fi, and that was basically the end of the episode. Yeah. And then what we find is that uh, they show us what happened with Josh. There's actually a flashback to the three days before. Yeah. On, so, um, yeah, so basically... Long story it's... short, he slept with her, he stole her blood, he took a picture, and he sent He took a, a picture text. of her sleeping, yeah. and with that picture, he texted it to whoever had asked him for the blood. He, he texted that... it to the Hulk King. Yeah, a person called the Hulk King. Who's the one who's the bad guy. He's yeah, the big bad and guy the saying, I got the blood. And I think, what, what else do you say? That's it, really. He just says, I've got the blood. Yeah. And um, if he just does it with emojis. Yeah, than, yeah, yeah. Rather it's... than writing it because... And he's smiling why? all the time while he's doing this. He's smiling yeah. all the time. So... I just want to make this... a point. Why did they show us this huge reinforced needle in the previous episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if... I mean, are we... Is, are they trying to say that he used that while they were having sex? <laughs> <laughs> or did he stab no. her while she's sleeping and she didn't realize? Yeah, he probably had a secret ring or something. Or, but the... or he's not really, he's not really I... used that thing. He's just using one of the things I didn't like thing. about the ending. I mean, we all knew this guy was a bad guy. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to be blooming a five-year-old not to realize this guy was going to be a bad guy from the previous episode because he was so, oh god, he's just like, he's just pathetic, really. Anyway. One of the things I would have liked to have seen is a rather ambiguous ending. I would have liked to see him, instead of sitting there smiling on, he's, he's, he's just, you see him texting from her bedroom, uh, you see him texting this message that he's got the blood and, and, um, and he just sends a photograph, and he's smiling like a Cheshire cat. I would have liked to have seen him in a fearful mode. So, you, so you've got a bit of an ambiguous thing. Is he actually a bad guy, or has yeah. he been forced into doing it? That's interesting. It? Like, imagine if his family's been kidnapped. Yeah, he's been asked to do yeah. this thing. Or maybe he's worried about her, and he's worried about consequences. And then the fact that he hasn't actually responded makes you think, actually, well, hold it, maybe he is dead. Yeah, and also the other thing, is, maybe he needs to be saved. They didn't need to do the flashback because they could have just progressed. They could have just the shown... whole episode could have been. You could have removed just about everything in the episode and just have that. Beginning, oh, the beginning yeah. you don't need any video, of the meditation and, stuff. Yeah, and the end. And None that's of it. the Emil Blonsky the whole, stuff needs yeah, to be exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. None of it needs to be there. Um, they could have put this on the end of the last episode, given how many extra minutes they have to play with that they're not using. They could have condensed the whole thing into Bloom. They, they could have put just, the whole oh, montage yeah. into the end of the last episode, including the end bit where he takes a picture of her and sends a text to this whole yeah, guy. Yeah. Because the last episode was less than half an hour. They're because, all less than half an hour. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're terribly I mean, they're short. Significantly less than half an hour. Yeah, but they I mean, could, was a particularly short one. They could one, have yeah. really just put that on the end of the last episode and not have any of this meditation stuff. And and actually, I know that they did the flashback, but why didn't they just do him delivering the blood? Because everyone would have known. Yeah, but then happened. you would have known. To... Everyone knows they slept yeah. together because you literally said we slept together. Yeah. Everyone would have known that he's got the blood and given it to someone because he's delivering the blood. Yeah, I think that the whole thing is just. So contrived. I've used this word a few times while we've been um, over, over the last few episodes. What again? What was the name of the episode again? I, I, I forgot what the name was. Just it? Jen. Just Jen. Well, actually, 
It's just boring. It's really unfortunate. <laughs> it's just boring. Yeah, yeah. It's really unfortunate. But throughout the, all these episodes, it's always been about um, Jenny's important. We shouldn't forget about her. But this was a total waste of space in terms of actually uh, the storyline. It had one or two um, better moments purely because it has got so low that those moments sort of are worth you, know, you notice them. So the group yeah. scene, the group session, I think was probably one of the best scenes in that entire series. Um, but it added nothing That's to it. the actual story. So, and it added nothing uh, to on. one's understanding of um, even Jen, to be honest. Because this whole thing about Jen recognising that She-Hulk is maybe uh, the one that's in charge or whatever, that's, you could argue that that's something that's, that's good that's come out like that. But it's a bit late in the day considering this is the seventh episode of a yeah. nine-episode series. Now, more than anything, what I felt with this episode, and by the way, we have got to the end of the episode. Yeah, the episode. And, and that is the worst thing. The, that is the end of the there episode. is hardly anything in this other than yeah. a little bit of... It's hard, this episode is like a nothing episode. Yeah, that's really what it is. And we... we um. They don't even have an end credit scene. They've just got some pic. They've got some uh, the standard sort of pictures they're doing. The gro- where they show yeah, like the exactly. matador in college and all that sort of stuff. But they don't really show anything in the the end credit. You learn nothing. And at the, in, with the with the the um, the graphics that come up with it. Yeah, the, and you know this idea that oh yeah, they're using the graphics and they're trying to hark back and you know it's really cool because it connects into the episode and all that sort of stuff. The fact is, if you think your your audience is so dumb that you have to tell them exactly what's happening, why are you making such intricate cartoons that people are going to try and yeah, pick up? Just, yeah, but just yeah, it is it, cool. It, on one side, you're saying your audience is a complete bunch of morons. On the other side, you're saying your audience is so smart that they pick up on each the Easter egg. I think the I think the I think the end credits. You know, when I think about how the end credits have been done with these uh, graphics and these cartoon sort of images, um, my own personal view is. These are aimed, whereas the series itself seems to be aimed at five-year-olds and kids, um, the end credit scenes uh, with these graphics are aimed at the people who consider themselves super fans and will probably, probably watch yeah. the uh, w- watch that those end credits at a tenth of the normal speed yeah. in case they've it's missed just, something because for, they're so frightened of missing an Easter egg. It's for the other YouTubers who want to make like Easter egg videos. Yeah, like, look exactly. Out, look 10 Easter eggs in the yeah. episode. There's probably a million Easter eggs there, but the reality is it's boring. It's boring. The That's the thing. The content is not good. Yeah. You can put a million Easter eggs in that I could connect to Doctor Strange and all this sort of stuff, but the content's not good. So for me, the easiest way to sum up this episode is... It's complete filler. It's just complete it is. It's filler. Just, it is. It and, is. And the last episodes. I mean, I I know. I thought the the Wong episodes were filler too, but this you are in the seventh episode of a nine episode series, and you're putting in a complete episode where she goes to a meditation resort and talks about the fact that she's been ghosted by someone who slept with her. This is the. This is all. This is that one actually away. is about ten seconds of the whole thing, this but that's is, basically summed up the whole episode. That's the whole episode, <laughs> and this is one episode away from the penultimate episode of the whole series, and you've been teasing Daredevil since episode one. Yeah, yeah. Your trailers before the series came out show Daredevil, so everyone's sitting here going, "Where is Daredevil?" You know, Daredevil should him. have been the previous episode because it was the episode before that that we saw the Can helmet. You tease the helmet. Yeah. So it's been two episodes now. Where you're expecting Daredevil to turn up and he's not there, and you wonder what on earth is going on. You know, did they run out of money? Did did Charlie Cox just decide the script is so rubbish? I want to end it at the end. For some reason, I think they're still filming the Daredevil episode, waiting for it to come out. <laughs> so it's it's one of those ones like, why would you keep delaying, keep delaying? It's almost like you haven't actually edited the episode properly. I'm kind of frightened of what they're going to do now because it's. it's I'm sure it'll be fine. There's no proper like story the developed. There isn't. A, there isn't actually a proper story developing. There's a. There's a. There, there's a grain of a story. You would think that yeah. by episode seven you have a proper story, That's but it. actually what you have is a few seedlings that have been planted, and that's about it. So there's no real proper formation of a villain 
you know they're obviously a villain because it's a superhero um, series. I really hope there is a villain. Almost, I mean, can you yeah. imagine if there's no oh, villain? <laughs> I'm almost, I, I'll be honest, I'm almost scared. I think it's still that creepy guy. but Yeah, yeah, um, I, I agree. I, I, you know, I'm scared that they think that they're trying to make a five-season show or something. I think, I, I'll tell you something. <laughs> That's I, why they're dragging it out so long. Like, we don't know who the bad right. guy is and there's two episodes left. And we know that one of the episodes is just going to be her at a ball winning the female female floor of the year I, for, I, for not winning any court cases. I agree. I, I tell you something. Part of it is me. Part of me is thinking, okay, we've got two more episodes left. They must have Daredevil in the next episode. Okay. Um, with that, that the final episode, you can just imagine the. It's not even going to be the main thrust of the episode. You can imagine a end of credit scene where you realise who the bad guy is, or they bring in a superhero from the Marvel Universe, and that's the teaser for the next season. Yeah, yeah, but she's not even the star of her own show yet because she's just boring. So let's just sum up the episode. Um, how are we going to rate it this time? Have you thought about a rating system? This one was really poor, and you know the bad. It's, it's, in some respects, it's easy to rate stuff you hate. This one had one or two scenes that I thought were okay because the previous episodes were so poor. I mean, the wedding episode was absolute. The last episode was just terrible. Okay. Mm. And the, the the previous episode to that was pretty poor. So the whole thing is the, the rating, to give this a rating... And then we've, we've kind of been joking about you know, a type of football team or food or whatever. But how do you rate something that is just like a non-entity in the series? It's a non-entity. This is, it didn't need to be there. It's, you've learned nothing. Should you've we, got nothing. Should we, should, should we rate it by like supernatural phenomenon? Well, I tell you, you say that. You the... know what I was thinking just as you were saying that? In my head, I had planets of the solar system. Yeah. Where Jupiter is magnificent because it's so big. Yeah. Earth is fantastic because it let's can do, sustain let's do life. Planets. Let's do planets. It's Pluto. Yeah, because it doesn't count it anymore. Count yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that we agree on that. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's Pluto because it doesn't count, it count anymore. anymore. Yeah, it's no longer and a planet. This is no longer 100% a proper series. 100% what this episode was. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to leave it there, actually. I think that's, that's summed up everything quite well. Yes, I, I agree. So uh, thank you for listening, guys. We will see you again for episode eight. Maybe Daredevil will be there. Maybe he won't. But we will. Maybe we will be there. We will be be there. there. Um, But Daredevil, who knows if he's actually in the series or not. (laughs) Maybe maybe they've hit us with the snake oil. That's right. So let's, uh, let's see how we get on. Thank you to everyone who's been listening. Like, comment and subscribe. And uh, see you then in the next one. Bye. Bye.